Yes. Red light's flashing. Oh yeah, this is really fun because, like I said, I don't think you've seen this presentation, but I've given it over and over. We just didn't have the technology and uh, it was difficult to set up. And now we got it all together. So, I told you we'd, we'd look at the veracity of John. So we will, but you get a freebie. This is actually part of a, what do you got? What do you got? We go, we go. This is actually part of a, a bigger uh, presentation, actually a class. And in the first class, we talked about some really neat things. I thought you'd like to see this picture. I didn't give it to you specifically. But um, if you didn't know, there are five, doc five major doctrines and five major theologies. This is something they usually don't teach about. But this is a diagram of that in time. So the first is called dogmatic. And dogmatic is not a negative. It means it basically is the basis of natural theology. And it's what I'm going to be showing to you. Dogmatic means you take historical fact and you use it as your, your doctrine. And that's what they did. So, for example, uh, we see that in... Um, What's it called? The, uh, the document that we use for all of our everything, but it's not, it, we don't even have, we have a, finally have a copy of it, but it was subsumed into, it's not in our New Testament, but it was subsumed into all of the doctrinal books used by the church. What is that called? Didache, um, the Didache. Yes, thank you, thank you. I'd forgotten. The Didache is considered a dogmatic Part of the dogmatic doctrine. In other words, this is the doctrine given by the apostles to the church, and the church used it, just like the New Testament documents were given to the church, and so they use it, right? So that's why we call it dogmatic, is because it's based not on what? No, no reason. There's no reason or, or theology or anything like that. And so you notice there's no theology. And the church went for a long time without any real theology, why? Didn't need it, right? You have the Catholic and the Orthodox, and they were fighting about other things, like, you know, how many fingers you used to do the sign of the cross, and a few other little issues like baptism, and, and you know, uh, uh, what is it? And, uh, you know, but in general, there was no theology to back it. And then you had natural theology, that, that's based in dogmatic, which we're going to be talking about, because we're talking about veracity. Then you had the Reformation at the age in, uh, beginning of the Age of Reason, right? And the Reformation did not make a new theology. Martin Luther said specifically he was taking natural theology, and that's it. Natural theology existed. And then you got Calvinism. And as a response to Calvinism, there was Armenianism, which is free will. And by the way, you notice... These also follow the natural churches. So you have natural theology defining Armenian, and you get within it the anacredal churches, like Baptist, Church of Christ. And then we have the evangelical age. Turbingen School, which I talked about, is a, is a theology of a bit of biblical criticism. And, and of, um, Turbingen School is the greatest problem we have in modern theology. And it is a whole theology school. And it came as a response to, I talked about a little bit last week, but you notice the evangelical came as a response to Turbingen. And, and in it, we have Vatican II. So the Catholics have actually gone on their own kind of way, although Vatican II is almost the exact same as uh, Reformation. Not Reformed, Reformation doctrine. These are doctrines and not theologies. So you can count, there's five theologies and five doctrines, and um, you can encapsulate almost every church and every denomination within it. So this is a freebie. I didn't write it down for you. It's, this is just a way of looking at the world. And if you notice in time, the Age of Reason, Age of Enlightenment, and the Industrial Revolution are really key tied to these theological ideas. Anyway, uh, you never got to see that picture before because, like I said, we didn't... You know, we really are just talking about veracity, and, and that was just a fun picture that is um, a map, right? A map of where we are in the world. 
So how do you prove history? And this is the question of veracity, right? Matter of fact, this is a question that I believe, well, in, let's see, 100 years ago, 120 years ago, in the 1800s, and even before the 1800s, before the 1800s, this is the question that everyone asked. This is a question. How do you prove history? And so, you know, I ask this in every veracity class, every time we talk about veracity, but, you know, if we pick a person in history that's, that the popular world knows really existed, you know, so pick Caesar or pick uh, Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln is a great choice. How about, uh, you know, George Washington? You know, we know they existed, right? So how do you know? What's the proof? So let's pick someone, let's pick, uh, I, I pick Abraham Lincoln, I use Abraham Lincoln all the time. Um, if, and this is, this is the tagline, right? What if I told you there's more proof uh, that exists for life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ than for the existence of any other person in antiquity? In antiquity. Now, what's antiquity? We'll talk about antiquity. But literally, if you think Caesar lived, or if you think Josephus lived, or if you think any any of the uh, any of the people you think lived in history before about 600 A.D., then there is more proof that Jesus Christ lived, died, and was resurrected than for any other person in history. Period. That. And that's what I'm going to show you. So how do you prove history? You can't use a scientific method. Remember I told you the three methods we have? We have three methods to know truth. We have the scientific method, we have the legal historical method. Uh, it's called also the evidence witness method. Do not confuse this. What's that method they use, the historical critical or something like that for, okay, don't get that confused. This is not a method of, of parsing scripture or understanding scriptural documents or New Testament or Old Testament at all. This is the scientific method is the method you use scientifically. You can only use it for repeatable events, period, dot. I'm not going to go into great depth. The legal historical method is the evidence witness method. Where do we use that in? Court of law. Court of law. Yeah, they used to teach this to everybody. Nowadays, to get this, you need to go to lawyer school. And even then, I'm not sure they're teaching it right. I don't know what they're teaching. Yes, sir? Well, you heard some of the arguments that the Supreme Court are making about... They're arguing back against the uh, mandate, but they're, they're touching on feelings. They're not going back and looking at the Constitution. Uh, some of the most ridiculous arguments I've heard. It shows why you need to impeach people and you shouldn't let people be in those areas of responsibility that aren't. You know? They're supposed to be law lawyers arguing legal historical. That's right. That's the point. The legal historical method is what they will use to put you in jail. To put you to death, to take away your life, liberty, and property. Okay? And in our country, supposedly, that's the only way they can do it. Although, mandatus from on high take away your life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness uh, without any respect to courts. But anyway, the legal historical method is that evidence witness, evidence witness method. And so evidence and witness so I count. So we have oral, written, and exhibits. That's it. Oral, written, and exhibits. Oral is oral testimony. If you write it down, it's written testimony. And if you have exhibits, those are, you know, evidence of something. Like archaeology, for example. And I'm moving already a little bit. So examples... Um, well, we'll get to more. You guys know what I'm talking about here. I don't think I need any more examples. Um, when we, we can use, again, well, don't worry about examples. We use three criteria to judge the actually of a written historical evidence. So whenever we have written historical evidence, um, we, we judge it, and this has always been done from the beginning of uh, using evidence in history, or, or evidence in courts. You do the same thing in a court of law. For example, now, um, well, let's talk about it. Okay, bibliographical, internal, and external. 
You have these three tests, bibliographical tests, the internal tests, and the external tests. We'll talk about each one of them. If a work passes all three tests in antiquity, then the source is considered indisputable unless you, it's, contra, it's con, contradicted by a source of greater degree or merit. Degree or merit is what we're going to talk about, degree or merit. So we're going to look at degree and merit. And I'll see if I can, I can put this in terms that are easily understood because we do the same thing for evidence in a court of law. You do the exact same thing in a court of law. So, but we do this, and this, by the way, how many of your professor or professorettes ever did this in teaching a historic history class? You ever had a history class in college? European history. Huh? European history. Yeah, they're supposed to do this. This is before you trust a document in history. Okay? As a matter of fact, what do most professors and professorettes do? They say, go buy this, go buy this textbook. <laughs> They say, go buy the textbook right, I wrote, one, right? Two, three. I wrote this textbook, <laughs> you know, it, it only costs 150 bucks. Here, get this, right? And, and the latest so, revision. And yeah, the latest so revision. History. You can't get the one from the previous year, right? They do that all the time. Well, they use a appeal uh, to authority. Well, that, that's, that's, that's a, a, a logical fallacy, but yes. Um, but the big deal with this is, the, the point is that every professor who uses, for example, if you go to Fringe University or Newman University or any university, Concordia, for example, and they're going to teach John, then I would expect them to do this. Give a bibliographical, internal and external, and go through this in detail because they have to prove the veracity of the work. Because if it, okay, so if I pulled up a Bhagavad Gita and said, we're going to study the Bhagavad Gita as history, and what would you say? There no, well, how do you know? Right? How do you know there's no history? How do you know it's not history? Or how about if I picked up um, a pen and teller? And so we're going to study pen and teller as history. And you go, well, wait a second, they're not history. Right? Well, what if I picked up Harry Potter? And I said, we're going to study Harry Potter as history. Right? And you're laughing. It's true. But, you know, yet there's, there's I guarantee you, and we'll see. I will show you that Josephus is trash historically. So how come every university in America, from every Ivy League down to Newman and Friends, is picking up Josephus to teach their New Testament classes? Now, you can use it as a comparison, but with, you see what it says? If a work passes all three tests, the source is considered indisputable unless contradicted by a source of greater degree or merit. So let's look at this. Let's look at the details of this. So first of all, degree of merit. Merit refers to how well the work passes the three evidentiary tests. Degree, merit, how well it passes the test. Degree is what is the, is it primary, secondary, or tertiary? Okay, primary is a first-hand witness. In a court of law, what do I want? A witness who? saw what happened, right? An eyewitness. Now, on the other hand, if a person said, well, Paul told me, what is that called? Hearsay. That's hearsay. Is it allowed in a court of law? No. It is not supposed to. That is a secondary witness. What, is, what do we usually consider in written historic history a secondary witness? Here's an example, okay? Uh, Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln shot in Ford's Theater, right? And his wife sitting right next to him is a primary source. Now she walks outside and a reporter comes up and puts a mic in her face and a video camera in her face and says, what did you see? That is a, her words are a primary witness, but the reporter's story is a secondary. Almost every news story you read, almost every news story you read is a secondary source. A tertiary source is a non-witness. So every textbook in history that you have is a tertiary source. 
Now, in the history books, what they try to do is they try to quote stuff, right? They make quotes, quotations from primary sources. Now, that doesn't make the history book a primary source, but it puts primary source evidence in the history book. A really good history book would be a book that had all kinds of primary source documents in it, right? And would just list, like, if uh, instead of telling you what the history did, if I had um, the letter, here, here's a letter from um, uh, George Washington Benedict, Benedict Arnold, right? Or here's the letter from Robert E. Lee to so-and-so about the Battle of Gettysburg, or, right? That would be a primary source, first-hand document, right? So when we look at degree, we look at primary, secondary, or tertiary. I like to call quatuary, but quatuary is like none or opinion. So the Bhagavad Gita is a quatuary source. It's, it's an opinion source. How about Harry Potter? Harry Potter is a quatuary source because it's not history, right? Or all now, you can get some really cool history from, you know, Dickens, for example. But guess what? Dickens is a primary witness to the times and place, but not necessarily to the story. It would be opinion. So you have to be careful, but you can use some, you know, there are other sources you can use, and what they do is, in history, we try to gain information sometimes the best we can, because if someone didn't write about it in the Victorian era, they didn't write about uh, going to the bathroom, uh, much about illnesses, much about underclothing, right? So how do you get that information? You've got to either dig it out somehow or, or get some kind of funny source, and they do that. They try to get that, but cultures are interesting. Anyway, merit is how well it passes the three evidentiary tests in degree is the primary, secondary, tertiary, etc. So uh, here, I'll mention this. Remember, if I have a primary document, it always trumps a secondary, which always trumps a tertiary, right? Always. And there's like opinion, none, right? So if someone wrote a, um, a news story from the Victorian era beats anything that Dickens wrote. A primary source, you know, of uh, Victorian era. Somebody writing about going to um, the glass, uh, the, the, the big World's Fair, or the big fair they had, right? Someone writing about that trumps any other source, right? So that's just to make it clear. A person who saw it firsthand trumps every other source. That's what degree is all about. Uh, now, in the bibliographical test, we examine how a document was transmitted to us in time. So we do this with all documents. So number one, we look at the number of manuscripts, and then we look at the time between the original and the earliest manuscript we have. So the number of manuscripts, and you say, why? Because there are no originals from any work in antiquity. Do I said? There are no originals from any work in antiquity. Period. Dot. None. The earliest document we have, and where antiquity kind of ends, antiquity really doesn't, antiquity ends where we start having manuscripts. And by the way, the first ones we have are of the Quran. The Quran are the earliest manuscripts that we believe were original. And there's three of those. And they're all different. Which you may kind of wonder. <laughs> but the Quran is not history. Right? There is no history in the Quran, if you haven't read it. The Quran is quatuary. It's opinion. It is some guy telling you what God's law is because some angel beat him on the head and said, hey, an illiterate guy, by the way, because he couldn't read or write. So he got somebody else to write it, and he dictated it wrong multiple times, but that's okay. Um, but, but that's what he wrote that was written down from his words. And so it's quatuor. It's, it's not even history. So it doesn't count. Now, you say it might be, might be primary source to what his evidence was, but you've got to have a little more evidence than that. But that's okay. Uh, you got a lot of history wrong, too, that he tried to put in. Um, but he was writing about stuff way in the past. Anyway. So we look at the number of manuscripts in the time between the original and the earliest manuscripts, but no originals from any work of antiquity. Now, we 
you can really count from the time of the printing press. So about, uh, what, 14, 1450-something, right? The time of the printing press is when, no kidding, we have printed manuscripts. Nobody else really had it. Now, the, the, uh, uh, the Chinese invented printing, but never went very far. You know why, right? Well, it wasn't the number of characters. What happened, what, the problem is they had no market. There was no market because the market was everybody, everybody had learned to read the Bible and they wanted to read the Bible. And so there was this huge market for the printing press. And guess what? The average person could afford to buy not a Bible or a book. They were way too expensive. But what they could buy is a paper or a treatise or maybe a... a um, copy of the book of like Hebrews or a copy of the book of Jude or something, a small copy. They could afford to buy that, but they couldn't buy a whole Bible. And you remember this thing called penny novels? Penny novels were chapters, and usually of 20 chapters to a novel. So you'd pay a penny for a chapter. And then if after you bought all, well, what a great deal, right? You buy it, you got a setup, right? So that, and, and by the way, every Every girl who was a rag picker, every girl who was working in industry at the time, were reading the penny novels. You got a, lot, you got a huge market. So there's a huge market for writing in the Western world, but guess what? There was no market in the Eastern world. Why? Only a very tiny group knew how to read and write. And so it was, you know, only if you have a very tiny market, you ain't got to sell so many products. So, in the West, when they invented the printing press, boy, they just it took off like crazy. And, well, we know what they exist. Anyway, so all, the man, all manuscripts are copied by hand, and that's one of the main things. If it's a work in antiquity, it's a manuscript copied by hand, and that's what we're talking about when we talk about manuscripts. We're talking about something that's copied by hand. So, in the bibliographical test, a work with more existing manuscripts is judged to be more accurate. Why? enough that someone took the time to write it down? Well, I'll give you that, but that's not really the reason. If, if I have one... Yeah, go ahead. You can compare the manuscripts. That's right. You can compare the manuscripts. So I, if I have five, like for example, we have five books of the dead from different epics. In, and guess what? Every one of them is different. different. So who knows which is right, right? Nobody has a clue. But if I have five documents and they're relatively similar or not very different, then cool. That means I know that I have an accurate picture, right? So if I have, let's say, 100, then I know, wow, that's very accurate, right? Because I can compare the differences. If I only have one, and it's been copied over and over and over again, I got a problem, right? Or three. In antiquity, the average number of copies is one. I'm going to show you some that we have more of. Let's see, look at ancient manuscripts. So here's some ancient manuscripts. These are histories. So um, this is slightly misleading, but I'll explain why it's, I put it in there. But if you look at this, I've usually given you this, but if you look at Catalyst, Catalyst is pretty good because we have three and not one. Okay, the number of copies, plenty of the younger, uh, Plato, Tetralogies, uh, seven, Caesar, uh, Euripides, we got nine, Caesar, we got ten of the Gaelic Wars, Aristotle, we got 49 copies, Sophocles, 193, these are ph philosophical works. Of the New Testament, there are 24,633 manuscripts, manuscripts. That means before printing, people wrote them down on paper by hand. 24,633. Now there's about 5,000 Greek manuscripts. 5,000 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. Now theoretically and, and most correctly there are 5,000 Matthew, 5,000 Mark, 5,000 Luke, and 5,000 John. There are 175 early Greek manuscripts. And I'm going to show you some more information about that. There are 100 early Greek manuscripts of John. And by the way, uh, well, we'll talk about this time span, but look at the earliest copy. 
The earliest copy of John we have, and I should change this, it should be 125 AD, actually. Yes, sir? If there's only 5,000 of the Greek, what are the other 19,000 copies in? Uh, Lat uh, Latin, um, Coptic, Aramaic, uh, other languages, um, Saxon. Um, they were translated like crazy. Um, there's codexes all over the place. So, you know, they were copies or translations from the original Greek. But there's about 5,000 Greek, but you can see it just, you know, a lot of them we have are Latin, because after the Vulgate translate, uh, translation, and um, what's his name, uh, the, the Greek, 300, uh, what's his name? Constantine. 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 Constantine had to make, I think, 50 copies of the Greek New Testament um, in a codex to be sent around to the known world. And they actually have some of those. They, they exist. They're extant. Really cool, right? But, and they're in Greek. But then the Vulgate translation was done. I think Constantine did it with, uh, what's his name? Uh, Justin. Saint Jerome. What's that? Jerome. Saint Jerome. I think it's Jerome or Justin. Jerome. Jerome. Anyway, he translated into Latin. And a lot of our problems began with the translation into Latin. Because the Latin and the Greek are not... Uh, compatible languages. Remember? Latin so euphemistic? Or? Latin is very, matter of fact, Latin is considered a romantic language, right? And romantic languages compared to, like for example, Greek, which is a non-romance language, totally. Greek is very concrete. And then you get to the why do you think? Why do you think all of the you know the Germans are supposed to be really stoic? Why do you think the German Germanic languages are so non-concrete, so euphemistic? Look, if you live in a refrigerator, you got to have some euphemism going on here, right? I mean, you're living in a refrigerator. You're living like in a climate that's worse than this, right? It's always cold. It's always damp. It's always you're always hungry. What, what does that mean? You know, when a kid comes in and he says, I'm starving, he says, no, honey, you're not starving. You're just not feeling very nourished, right? So you've got to develop euphemisms because people are starving to death. Now, if you live, up, you live in a sub-Saharan and, and, like, every time you pick a you know, coconut, you break it open and you've got free food, I mean, you're not feeling so bad, right? So you don't need euphemism. The Greeks seem to have a very, um, even though they were a starvation culture, you know, the ones that were not starving were the guys who could read and write, and they were, you know, had this, you know, 25%, 20% of the population rest were slaves, and the slaves are taking care of them, and the slaves are starving, the slaves aren't writing. So I guess, you know, you don't need euphemism except for slaves. And the slaves probably had all kinds of euphemisms, I bet you, right? <laughs> yes, sir? The, the uh, concept of purgatory came from an error in translation in St. Jerome's there are a lot of problems, like for example, predestination. There is no word in Greek for predestination, but remember how I showed you? Calvin took one word, one word used once in the New Testament. And election too. Um, by the okay, I, I'm going on a rabbit track, but uh, there were no elections in Greece. How did they pick? How did they pick, pick the members of their democracy? By lot. They were not, there was no elections, okay? In a, in, one of the reasons that our country is not a democracy is because in a democracy you can pick people lots of ways. Uh, one is through voting. That's a method, right? That's called election. We elect people that are representatives to our representative republic, which that's what we are, representative republic, constitutional republic. We are, but we are not a democracy because in a democracy you can pick people now the phone book, which might be better than the way we do it right now. But, and that, I'm quoting uh, Buckley, right? Buckley said that. Anyway, uh, but if you look at this, what's really interesting is here's when it was written and the earliest copy. So John, uh, 90 to 99, 90 to 100, uh, 70. I'd say 70 to 100. I'm going to tell you 70 to 100. Uh, 70 to 100, 130, 125. It's less than 40 years. So the earliest manuscript we have is about less than 40 years between when it was written. Um, catalysts, you got a problem. 
because it was written in 20, uh, 54 BC. The earliest copy is 1550 AD. And the time span is 1600 years. I think there's a possibility it could get messed up. How about, how about this? You know, um, the best in the non New Testament is like Sophocles. Let's see, I think it's Sophocles. Uh, no, uh, Plenty the Younger. About 750 years. Wow. Yes, sir. So, in, in Catalyst, for instance, where we say it was written in 54 and the earliest copy was 1550 AD. So that means the there's no original left of that. All no original of any of these. No original of any of these. There's no original for any New Testament document. There's no original for any document in antiquity. Did, did the original exist in 1550? No. When the copy was made? No. This is just the earliest copy we have right now. And, it's, um, and I have to know, it's in a, it's a British, you know, see, the British were explorers right back in the age of, um, of the Enlightenment. And the British were going out trying, finding these things, right? And so some British laird, British laird found it and bought it from some guy, right? Bought Catalyst because he could read it because they all knew Latin and, Latin and Greek, right? So he bought it and he kept it in his library. And it was, he had it in his library. And so... He, that's the copy. He bought it, right? And he thought he was doing good until he found out that his neighbor had plenty from uh, 850 AD, right? So these documents now have been collected by different museums in different places. Some of them are in private hands, which is probably safer for them in than in museums, where the museums will sell them. That happens all the time, too, illegally or legally. But, but back to Roger's question, where that copy had to have come from something. Was it word of mouth, or did they have the original when they wrote it? No, no, no. The, or copy. This is the, late, this is the earliest copy we have. There were earlier copies, but they were either destroyed or lost, or, you know, they may be out there. You know, you may be digging in your garage sometime, and you, you come across, well, probably not, but if you're digging in the middle garage, east, but... Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't seen ours. <laughs> there you go. Whoa, that's good. If you live in the Middle East and you have some caves on your property, you might start digging and you might find something, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? That's what they found. And they found, you know, really pretty ancient documents. But that's where they find them, is, you know, you find them, somebody stashed them away, or, or usually these earliest, these copies are ones that were found in libraries, in people's libraries. But the previous copies, right, were, were made and lost destroyed, whatever. I mean, the name of the rose, right, which is totally bogus. Remember what I told you, the average library had seven works in, in antiquity, right? Average library had seven works in it. So that, you know, you're lucky you have that many. Yes, that sir? include the Library of Alexandria, which was this famous one that was supposedly lost? <laughs> yes. Um, you know, The ancient world, once something is done, is very prone to exaggeration. If you never noticed, right? Like so, Hercules. What's that? Like the story of Hercules. Well, the story of anything. So, you know, in the past there were people that were super strong. There were treasures abounding, right? In the, in the whatever. There, were, there was paradise, right? The paradise stories, you know, story, right? I mean, almost every culture has some paradise story, right? whether before life or after life, you know. Very few have the beginnings of them, but there's always some paradise. Shangri-La, right? So things get better with time. And so the Library of Alexandria probably had 100 works in it. But by the time we get to the 20th century, the average person thinks that the Library of Congress is what the Library of Alexandria was, right? There were probably libraries in Egypt that had more works than the Library of Alexandria. That is Egypt, but, you know, the ancient Egyptians... They used to store their works in, as pages and not scrolls, which has a real problem because pages don't tend to last uh, very well. You know, scrolls tend to last a little better than papyrus. But anyway, uh, that's, that's one of the words of the day I haven't gotten into. But anyway, yeah, this is, let, let's, look, let's keep going because there is more. There's more to the story. Here's, here's a graph, right? And sometimes they give you this, greater is better. And so you can see... Uh, and I threw on this a few others that I didn't have in the other ones. And the reason I threw them on is because 
These are non-historical works. The most that we have probably in the whole world is Homer, the Iliad. We have 643 copies, manuscripts of the Iliad. Uh, but still, the New Testament, 24, 633, and even 5,000, uh, 5,000 Greek documents. Um, yeah, most of these don't even, don't even do it. And yet, you know, the most famous figure in the whole world, Caesar, Tacticus, Aristotle, Sophocles, Demosthenes, yeah, right? But I have hardly anything they wrote at all. Wah, wah, wah. Anyway, uh, this is just a bibliographical test, so don't worry. I mean, maybe we'll get some more respect back for him. Iliad, next best in the New Testament. We, have almost, we are almost certain we have the complete text of the Iliad as written by Homer. Why? We've got 647 copies, and we can compare them, and we can figure it out. However, we are 38 times. Two magnitudes more certain, we have the complete text of the New Testament. Do you know what I said? Does anyone understand magnitudes? 38 times. Two magnitudes. Now, you heard that from your teachers, right, in college every day. And, and you heard that in primary school every day, in, in middle school and high school every day, right? Whenever they talk about history, they said, we can trust the New Testament more than we trust anything, Right? Well, they did until 1800. They did until 1800. And it wasn't because new stuff. It's because they all knew this. And they could read it. So, what's happened? I'd say it's propagandized. Prop propagandizing your children, and you, and me. Because I was propagandized this way, too, until I got a hold of Josh McDowell and some of his other stuff, and actually started reading about this because this is what you do in history. Every historian is supposed to do this. All right, so the next test is the less, lesser, the less the time interval between when the original and the earliest existing manuscript, the more accurate the work is considered. So the one is, do I have the text, right? Do I have all the text? So if I have more works, I know I have more text. I'm more, I, I'm more certain of the text. So. In the next test, it's the time interval. So if the time interval is small, and we'll, let's, look at it. let's look at the chart. We've got the chart up again. <coughs> same chart, okay? So the same chart, and, and now we're looking at the time span. So if 40 years elapsed, then I know that these, this manuscript is more or less accurate. It has to be, right? Because I, haven't, I've got, I don't have 1,600 years to screw it up, right? And by the way, um, how many dictionaries invent, were invented? None. Who invented the first dictionary? Webster. 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 Webster and then Johnson followed with his. But until Johnson and Webster, which is about uh, 1850, I think, about 1850 when Webster did his dictionary, Everybody spelled the words like they thought they ought to spell. Was was W-U-Z to most people, right? <laughs> so people just spelled however they wanted. The meanings of the words were not, you know, really super accurate. What do you think it was like for Greek or Hebrew or for Latin, right? There's no dictionary. Nobody invented the dictionary. It's a inv new invention. So... This time span, and if you notice, these are the works of antiquity history. For the New Testament, the average is about 80. But for Matthew, I got 130, about 175. For Mark, for Luke, 130. For John, it's less than 40. And we're going to study John. So of all the Gospels, which is probably the most accurate? John. You don't hear that often, do you? Here's the, here's the picture. Less is better. So you look at the less is better picture, span of years between authorship and the earliest manuscript. There's your thing, New Testament, less is better. And then here's the earliest manuscripts. Uh, if you go look at this, you can look this up. This is the papyrus earliest manuscripts. Um, before 66 AD, we have the Magdalene papyrus that has parts of Matthew. We have parts of Mark. Could be as early as AD 50. 
these, these are fragments. We only have fragments. We don't have the whole manuscript. So they don't count as manuscript. They count as a fragment. Uh, Timothy, before 68, 66, we have the Barcelona Papyrus with Matthew, parts of Matthew. We have the Paris Papyrus with Luke and Paul's epistles, 85 AD. 85 AD, the Pauline Codex. We have um, Gospel of John, near complete, 125, already talked about that. That's Codex P66, Papyrus 66. John Rennes Greek, you know. Um, these are the earliest ones. These are the early ones. And remember I told you there's over 5,000 Greek? I could put 5,000 on here. We'd be still going for class next week, you know, because there are a whole lot of them. Um, Dead Sea Scrolls, they, they may have a bit of mark in there. Uh, Dead Sea Scrolls are all Gnostic. Do you know that, right? The uh, All the Dead Sea Scrolls are either... Hebrew or Gnostic documents. And what's really interesting about the Hebrew and Gnostic documents is occasionally you get a little bit of real stuff in there. <laughs> See? So, anyway, very interesting stuff. What about the Epic of Gilgamesh? What is that considered? Uh, myth. Made up. What, but is there, are there documents? Um, it is so... There are some tablets that we know of that have them, but they're not manuscript tablets. There are some, you know, written stuff, but they're way late. And the Epic of Gilgamesh is, you know, a lot of it was passed down and came through Zostranism. So there are some, it, they, they, they're not considered history. It's like, I don't have the Bhagavad Gita here. As a matter of fact, okay, in a later class, uh, in this class, when I teach this class, I go through all the documents, ancient documents of religions. Okay, so from the, uh, you know, from the um, Mormons, the Quran, uh, all of them, and show you this way. But what I'm doing here is taking real historical documents. How do we know they're historical documents? They say they are. The Epic of Gilgamesh says it is about a mythical person. So it tells you right away it's fiction, that it's opinion, it's a myth, right? It's kind of like Zostranism. I've got quotes from a lot of in, in Gilgamesh. So no matter how many documents you have, if you tell me it's fiction, right? But it's always compared to the flood story in the Old Testament. We're not talking about Old Testament. Remember, when we were talking Old Testament and Torah, I told you there's serious problems with Torah. The main problem with Torah is witness. Yeah. It's the degree of witness. If I have zero, if I, have, if I don't have a... If there's no witness to it, okay, who, who wrote about the flood and saw it? Nobody. Nobody. I have a serious issue with that. I, I mean, I, I have a historical issue with that, Moses right? Moses is basically quoting God. What's that? Moses is basically quoting God. Moses is saying that God told me this. But I, but I got a problem with that from a historical standpoint. It's the same right with the Quran, okay? I, I'm not equating them, okay? Remember, we in the Torah class, that's why I took so much time to prove the veracity of the Torah documents and how they came to us. But I told you then, you got a serious problem with the Torah documents. And the problem you got is the problem of a lot of documents. So if, if, if the Quran and the Torah, the, before there's primary source, have the same problem, right? When uh, Muhammad says, God told me to write this. It's a question of belief. It's not a question of truth. What I'm showing you is truth, right? These stand up to any measure. Right? It's historical legal, so it would stand up in a court of, and it does. As a matter of fact, every single, I, I have never, ever read an account of a person that went to disprove Christ, who was who, a lawyer, or you know, there's lots of lawyers and judges that did that, who tried to disprove Christ, and guess what their conclusion was? They were wrong. They were wrong. Josh McDowell is one of the same guys. He was a lawyer. C.S. Lewis is the same way. C.S. Lewis, yeah, he was a, but he wasn't a lawyer. But yeah, but no. there, there are lots of lawyers who have written accounts that where they tried to disprove Christ and disprove the Gospels and disprove, and guess what their conclusion was? Based on historical legal method, it has to be verifiably 
Accurate. Correct. Yes, sir. I'm still pondering something from your previous slide. Were, were those the man, earliest manuscript dates in the far right, or the date the book was written? I've got these here, or the, the, the dates on the far right column. On the, or, or this right. is when we believe it was written. Okay. And this is the earliest copy in the time span between the written. So that we believe that these documents were written in this time. So if John was an actual eyewitness disciple. How was it written after what would have been his lifetime? Or why? His lifetime, uh, people generally believe that he lived to about 100, or okay. lived to at least to see the turn of the century. Okay. So he was younger than Christ. Christ was born in 6 BC. So most of the disciples, I don't know, some were older, some were younger. Uh, John is thought to have lived. Um, and this, the early date now is 70. People are putting the early date for John at 70 before the destruction of Jerusalem. But, you know, that's a, que that's a great question in history, right? But at the end of his life, uh, the witnesses to it say that at the end of his life, that's when John wrote the gospel. <laughs> Like, great questions, it's, yeah, very important. So, um, when the younger history next best in the New Testament, 800 years compared to 80, that's a magnitude. Based on the bibliographical test, you more certain New Testament is a collection of historical documents than any, any, any other work in antiquity, period. Of All historians know this. And if they don't tell you flat out, they're lying to you. All historians know this, because if they don't know this, they're not... Historians. Historians. You have no clue. Yeah. If you ask them about these, these are very important things that they are not teaching your children or not teaching you. So the bibliographical test only defines how well the work reflects the original. It doesn't define the veracity, the historicity of the original text. This has come back to the question of Gilgamesh. So if I had copies of Gilgamesh or whatever, then I could review them in a similar way. But we'll see when it does. The internal and external tests are then used... To establish the veracity, that's the historical validity. So let's see what that means. First of all, internal tests. I look for lack of internal contradictions. Anybody read Gilgamesh? It is so contradicted. It, most people haven't read it. That's the thing. If you've read it, you read Zoster and you read, you read Muhammad, oh man, you talk about contradictions. Left and right and right and left. They don't know where they're going. Book of Mormon is full of there, no place in the Book of Mormon mentioned has ever existed or ever been found in archaeology in the, in the New World or the Old World. So what does that say? Anyway, um, the cohesiveness, and is it comprehensible? You guys read the New Testament? We're going to look at it in Greek. In a translation even, it's comprehensible and cohesive. Um, look at the degree of witness. Gilgamesh, was it a primary? No. Was it a secondary? No. It's tertiary, right? Um, degree of witness. We're going to look at John. John is, claims to be a primary witness. He saw it. We'll talk more about that. You look, is it geographically placed, right? Um, you know, if I'm writing, if I'm Josephus writing about something that happened in, in the Holy Land, well, that's pretty close, right? But if I'm writing about something that happened in Persia, or happened in Greece, or Greek writing about something that happened, right? Herodotus uh, maybe have visited all the stuff he talked about, but maybe not. There's always a question there. Um, chronologically, were they there, right? Were they there when they wrote it? Or was it, were they within the chronological thing? Josephus wrote about places he never was there, and he never was there in the time. But he wrote about it. Okay? Historical claims. Gilgamesh claims to be a myth. Is it fiction? Is it opinion? The Quran says that it's, it's God's opinion, but it's an opinion, right? <laughs> so who are you going to trust, right? Anyway, um, is it fiction? Does it claim to be myth? Zostrianism, the, um, uh, the Greek myths claim to be myths. Okay, this ain't hard. Uh, the New Testament claims to be history. History. 
<laughs> Look for a lack of internal contradictions. Many other words. And, and I should bring examples. In this class, in the class I teach here, you know, it's, it's like a full semester class, so I, I bring in all the examples. And when you, I, give you, I give you the best there is. And you read them and you go, huh? Huh? I've read about every document in antiquity from, I've read about every document in antiquity. The Greeks had a great margin on logic, reasoning, and cohesiveness. Zostrianism is way out. Gilgamesh is way out. The Bhagavad Gita is crazy, crazy. You know, the Book of the Dead, okay, they only work when you're dead, and I'm not testing it, but I'm telling you, it's, it's crazy stuff. Hey, crazy tune stuff, right? If you saw our cartoon, you wouldn't enjoy it because it's crazy tune. Anyway, the New Testament works display no evident internal contradictions. Internal contradictions. Uh, cohesive and comprehensible. Again, many other works in antiquity. I have examples. I, I don't have examples with me here. Anyway, New Testament both. Co well, you know they're cohesive. Can you read? Can you understand them? I can't. You know, Hebrews is difficult, but we did the whole Hebrews. I thought it was, once you got it right in the translation, it, it got pretty comprehensible. But yeah, it, it's, it is even comprehensible even though you don't live in a culture of sacrifice or the Greek culture. So I'd say it's pretty comprehensible. Um, you look at degree of witness. So primary, second, tertiary, we're going to study John, which is a primary witness. He claims to have seen it. We'll go look at that. Geographically, he was not in Rome. He was actually, we think it was in Ephesus when he wrote it. In fact, I gave you some notes. And chronologically, as a matter of fact, I added, I gave you some really cool notes in today's thing. So you look at it, the legal historical, biblical tests, I got that. Degree of witness primary, written between 70 to 100 AD in Ephesus, likely. 100 Greek manuscripts, early Greek manuscripts. And 125 AD, the earliest, P66, the oldest codex. Um, I gave you some information out there. There's 17 Old Testament quotes. We'll look at that. 33 Old Testament allusions. 31 apocryphal allusions. Mysterion is mentioned zero. Church is mentioned zero. Synagogue mentioned five times. It's written to Hebrews who spoke Greek and quoted by the Apostolic Fathers. And I got a little note for you there. Some, some cool information with dates and events. But we'll look at that in more detail. As we, well, we're not going to study the canon in this class, but anyway. Here is a bigger kind of thing um, that gives more information on documents. And the reason I put this in here is because um, Herodotus, uh, I, got, I got his, these are all good history. So I got, I got Herodotus, Theodocles, I got, uh, let's see, Josephus, Josephus' war, um, the date of the events, you notice the early manuscripts, the lapse of into manuscripts, and these are what they're teaching your children right here about the New Testament era, is Josephus. And you notice they're using documents that are uh, 900, they're 1,000 years old. They're using manuscripts that are 1,000 years from the source, and yet the source was writing, here is the author's lifespan, and he was writing about the date of events that were basically most of them outside of his lifetime. Um, and yet they're a thousand years out. So instead of using the New Testament documents they're using to teach New, New Testament time history, they use Josephus. Now that's a secondary, that's way, the merit and degree is way out, in my opinion. But, you know, that's what they're using to teach you and your kids. Um, Tacticus, you know, look at this, this is just expanded information about the times. I usually give you something like this, I've given it to you before in the past. Um, what happened there? Oh, New Testament documents are primary or secondary sources, geographically placed, chronologically present. That was on that chart. And compared to other works in antiquity, the New Testament documents fulfill all the internal qualifications, at least as well or better. And based on bibliographical and internal, a work, remember, based on bibliographical and internal tests, a work is always historically given the benefit of the doubt. You know what that means? If, for example, you have a document that says, this happened, like, uh, I saw Jesus' death and resurrection. Okay, unless you have another document that says, somebody goes, I saw Jesus' death, but he never resurrected. And let, let's say, uh, oh, this, this is even better. I heard that, that Jesus died, and I heard that he didn't resurrect. That's a secondary source. So who wins? 
John Wimps, right? The source that was primary and saw it. And if there's a contradiction, guess what? There are no contradictions. So, you know, all historians know this. Every historian in the world knows this. Yes, sir. I was just thinking, too, in a court of law, when you got one witness that your whole case is pending on, one witness can be wrong. Two pe ten people can see the same event happen and give you multiple disagreeing descriptions of, oh, what happened, I heard it happen over there. No, it was definitely over here. But when you've got more than one witness that agree, that cements the fact into, that's what bases the, the truth of it, basically. Yes, you're right on the money. I'll give you more than that, though. Why is this suddenly become a popular study that witnesses don't prove the truth and veracity. It's, it's a new idea. It's brand new. It came from a, a French philosopher who, by the way, uh, died penniless, was an idiot, and if you've read his philosophy, you might as well rip it in two because it's incomprehensible. But a French guy proposed this philosophically that people, you know, and, and they supposedly have found it, right? When you, you ask people about multiple events, they always, their details are wrong. But guess what? They're always right about the big picture, like for example, if you have a car wreck and, and people there's a car wreck and the cars you know collide, they might be wrong about the color of the car, they might be wrong about the type of the car, but guess what they never miss? That was a crash, it was a wreck, because that in, in, in their memory. But what they do is, and they love to do this in school, they're doing it to your children and doing it to you. They're saying, oh, historical evidence and evidence, witness evidence is not good. So therefore, we could let all the criminals out because many times their details don't match. You can't trust your eyes. You can, and they say you can't trust your eyes. But you see what I'm saying? No matter what happens, you know, an aircraft accident is classic because people are ignorant about aircraft. So they say, oh, yeah, you know, I saw an airplane hit another airplane and la, la, or I saw one explode in the sky or I heard this or heard that, you know. And the details are wrong, but guess what? They were right. There was a you know, collision, or there was a crash, or there was other things. But the problem is that people don't remember details as well as we think, especially under crisis. But guess what? In history, are they under crisis? No. They're thinking about it, right? And so if you give me more time to think about the circumstances and stuff, especially I'm a good historian, what do I do? I go back in history and look at this stuff, right? Oh, uh, we'll, we'll just have to conclude this next week. Is that okay? Because, you know, the first time I give you the slides, I know it takes a little time to get through them. Uh, they're supposed to be for one class and a one, one hour class, but, um, you know, you guys always have great questions. And this is a very important concept that we need to indelibly put in our minds and in our children's minds, in my opinion, because we are being cheated, horribly cheated, by uh, our, our current academic stuff. Thank you, Father, for your word. Pray you look after us this week. In your name we pray. Amen. Monday. Tomorrow, no, but this Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday. Okay.